name is Ketabon. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. I am doing another book pairing video today and this is part of a series that I started because I just noticed that I was gravitating towards books that naturally paired really well together and um, they got me thinking about the same kinds of themes and topics and things like that and after a few times of this happening organically I started to do a little bit of a series and this pairing actually today is also very organic. I was actually putting together my little pile of books by uh, black African American writers for Black History Month and uh, one of the books in this pairing was in that pile and I had completely forgotten what the book was about and then I picked up the second book from the library uh, not noticing the similarities or overlapping themes until I started reading them both at about the same time. So it was very uh, bizarre experience reading them both together but a super enriching one so I thought I'd share some of my thoughts around that with you today. And most of those thoughts actually are about the intersectionality between race and deafness or disability um, because those are both subjects that I have extensively read about, researched about, know about um, independently but not necessarily together and not with the intersection of the two. And so both of those books explore those uh, experiences and um, I'm really excited to talk about them today. So the first book is We Love You Charlie Freeman by Caitlin Greenidge. It's her debut novel published in 2016 and it's about a black family moving to a rural town to live in a scientific institute in order to teach a baby chimp uh, sign language as a member of their family. And the second book is True Biz by Sarah Novich. It was published in 2022 and it's the story of a deaf teenage girl who had been deprived of language her whole life until she's finally allowed to go to deaf school and meet other deaf people for the very first time. So just some very obvious like very like in your face similarities that like I just could not ignore from the first few pages. They're obviously both coming of age stories. They're you know their protagonists are teenage girls but weirdly enough the protagonists are both named Charlotte nicknamed Charlie <laughs> which I was like whoa this is actually confusing you know I read a lot of books at the same time and a lot of people are like don't you get them confused and I'm like no they're always so different and these two I was actually like wait which Charlie are we talking about so for the purposes of this video I'm actually going to call the Charlie in We Love You Charlie Freeman um Charlotte because she sort of switches back to Charlotte because the monkey is named Charlie which is another <laughs> part of the book but um so I'll call Charlotte the from the We Love You Charlie Freeman book and Ch Charlie will be the protagonist from True Biz just for the purposes of this video. So in Ch We Love You Charlie Freeman none of the characters are actually deaf. The family that is moving and teaching the chimp sign language none of them are deaf they all just sign fluently and uh, so the focus on that book is more race and then in True Biz everyone not everyone but all of the characters in the school are deaf it's full of deaf characters and there's one student in the school who is black where the intersection of race and deafness come up um, in a very specific part of the book uh, and both books explore queer relationships which um, the details I don't really want to get into because it's very spoilery but I didn't want to leave out that both books do also explore the intersection of these other things and queerness as well. And the first big theme that I think is really similar in these two books is the theme of truth or real talk uh, however you want to put it. So so True Biz, the title of one of the books, is um, an ASL slang term for real talk or like talk to me straight kind of thing. And that really is the, the theme of the book, um, you know, exploring all the different truths and realities that oppressed or marginalized groups of people have had to deal with and what we need to do or what needs to be done still to, to make that not the case anymore. This book is really super, super strongly infused with activism and social justice and, and it's very much like in your face upfront, not subtle at all. <laughs> Whereas in We Love You Charlie Freeman, most of the truth seeking is done um, more per on a personal basis with Charlotte as she seeks more and more about the truth of the Tony B Institute, which is where her family's moved to teach this baby chimp sign language. And she slowly is uncovering, you know, the reality of this place, the history of the Institute, who owns the Institute, all these different things kind of are slowly coming together for her as she uncovers the truth and, and grapples with what that means for her, her family, and her life. Another thing I noticed very acutely because because I was reading the books at the same time, is that their arcs, um, the, the vibe of their arcs are actually very opposite. True Biz, even though it is infused with really sad situations and a lot of tough subjects and, you know, it doesn't really have like what I would call a happy ending by any means, it still has this like arc of hopefulness. Like, you know, we start off with Charlie being very despondent, like she can't communicate with anybody. She really struggles socially because of that. And 
you know, be, being in a deaf school and all that really changes her for the better. And she, even though she learns more about terrible things as time goes on in the book, like we're introduced to more and more horrific things over time, it doesn't have this like drag down gloomy feeling. It's all about like, what can we do to change it? What, how can we fight against it? Whereas in with the We Love You Charlie Freeman book, you know, you pick up the book and you read the back and you're like, oh, a family learning, you know, teaching a monkey sign language, like that's so cute. <laughs> and, and then as you read, like almost immediately, it feels very much like the movie Get Out. I hope you've seen it. If you haven't, please go watch it. Um, where, you know, nothing is wrong. Like you can't, point to anything specific but you just have this feeling that something is not quite right and as it progresses it just gets more and more creepy more and more suspicious but again you can't pinpoint exactly what the problem is until you're quite far into the book and then all of a sudden it's like oh yep 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 <laughs> So as you progress more and more throughout the book, you're very sure something bad is happening. You're just not sure exactly what it is um, or exactly, or maybe rather where it's coming from. So for example, so right away we find out, like I mentioned, that the family is not deaf, but they all sign fluently. But you can't help but shake the feeling that it's very strange that, that a scientific institute would pick a black family to, to have a specifically a chimpanzee become a member of the family. Like that's the structure of the experiment. They specifically want to know if learning accelerates or is more improved by being a member of the family. And so with all the racial undertones and connections with like monkeys and black people, like you, you're just like, really? Nobody thought that was strange? And, and of course later we find out the truth, but it's one of those initial things that right away you're like, wait, is this supposed to be creepy and weird or are we supposed to be you know judging ourselves for thinking it's creepy and weird anyway both of the books start off with our protagonists moving to a new place a new school and they really um get drawn into feeling the pull of activism um, as they meet new people and learn about new things as i mentioned earlier true biz is at depiction of activism is very intense and very like we are doing the work we are making the change and that's not bad it's just like if if somebody you know is um not open to all forms of activism maybe that's <laughs> that might be a little jarring um i don't want to get too um like spoilery with the details but basically a lot of people oppose the forms of activism that are happening in true biz so it, it's very much like activism in the forefront. So on the other hand, the, the the activism that Charlotte does in We Love You Charlie Freeman is very individualized and she, you know, has to do a lot of personal uh, research and exploration to figure out what is actually going on at the Tony B Institute and she feels a lot of pressure to, to like sort of expose or share that information from some people but other people like her family for instance don't want her to jeopardize their personal situation, their financial situation, their job security and so she has to weigh all these factors and it's uh, quite difficult for her um, to sort of make those decisions as a young adult but um, you know those are things that most activists do have to do often <laughs> and that brings us to class so the activism that Charlotte is doing on her own she's helped by her friend Adia and her mother who are black women living in the white part of town so they're very privileged they're very economically secure. They are the pressure that Charlotte is experiencing about uncovering the truth, telling the truth, etc, etc. But they are not the ones that have to feel the consequences. Her family is the one that would end up without jobs, without homes, etc. And so they're not fully aware of the class aspect of this truth telling around the racial atrocities that the Institute is committing. And so that's a really interesting intersection in We Love You Charlie Freeman. Whereas in True Biz, the class distinctions are um, sort of both um, traditional economic and also um, there's like a special kind of class system within the deaf community which I found very interesting. Charlie quickly realizes that even within the deaf community there is a class system so she meets Austin, one of her classmates, who is uh, what they call deaf royalty, which means he's a deaf child born to deaf parents, born to deaf parents, born to deaf parents. So multiple generations of deaf people. And this is considered a good thing. You know, of course, from a personal perspective, they, they enjoy their culture and they want it to, you know, feel um, like they're passing down parts of their culture to their children, but also just um, objectively, deaf children born to deaf parents generally do better. 
because they're not having any of the issues that children born to hearing parents have, unfortunately. So um, there is sort of this hierarchy in the school where Austin is basically automatically popular, which is sad that that hierarchy has to exist because it's not something intrinsic, but that 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 separation of groups has happened because of the way basically hearing, hearing parents are currently unable to care for their children um, because of systemic barriers and ableism, let's be frank. <laughs> And then on the more like realistic, practical side of class, the one of the big themes in this book and debates in deaf culture in general is cochlear implants. And so we learn uh, relatively quickly that cochlear implants are something that's not actually accessible to most families. So while insurance and the government might cover the actual implantation of the device, you don't just implant the device into a child and you're done, it requires hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of therapy and basically retraining the child's brain to uh, interpret these uh, electrical impulses that the, the device is, is generating in the brain to help them understand sound. So this isn't something that you just, it's a one-time expense and it's done. So really only wealthy families can access this therapy, and, which is really sad considering that basically I think the majority of the larger world thinks that, you know, sort of deafness is not an issue because of cochlear implants and so that was really interesting to explore as well. And the two biggest themes that I found super interesting in these two books were the themes of language and community, um, how they intersect, how they interact with one another, um, how far is someone willing to go for either of those things, are they the same thing, are they similar, all those things are explored in both, it's really really interesting. So the goal in We Love You Charlie Freeman is to get this chimp to communicate, we want to be able to communicate with the chimp, right? And so a lot of the questions in this book are about where are the lines, where, how far are we willing to go to integrate this chimp into a human level of communication? Um, what are those boundaries? Are we willing to break those boundaries? All of those questions. I can't really get too much into the details without spoiling, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so while in True Biz, Austin's mother has another baby, and that baby uh, is shockingly born hearing, and this is very destabilizing to the family. They feel like she won't be part of their community. It's very, you know, difficult. Then very quickly, she starts to lose her hearing. Even though she was born hearing, she loses it very quickly. Um, and that basically begins the debate of whether or not to give her cochlear implants. So if you don't know, cochlear implants are electronic devices that are inserted into the brain that send um, electronic signals to the auditory nerve. So it sort of bypasses the ear, essentially, and goes straight into the brain. So it, it, some, it allows someone to hear sounds, but it doesn't actually restore hearing. And it also permanently damages any natural hearing the person might have had. So if they're partially deaf or can hear some sounds, a cochlear implant would basically eliminate that possibility for the rest of their lives. And it, unfortunately, it works best when the child is as young as possible. So the consent issue is very murky for children, and that is where most of the controversy comes from. And the deaf community consider cochlear implants a tool of genocide on their community. Um, and this is mostly because, if you didn't know, the deaf community is considered an ethnicity by all definitions. Um, so even though there's no racial component, um, the deaf community meets all the criteria of being an ethnicity. So anything that is meant to basically eliminate people from that group um, is they consider genocide. But anyway, back to the book. So essentially, Austin's family now has to deal with this question for the very first time, and they need to figure out what are they willing to do or not do in order to, you know, keep their child part of their community, make sure she can uh, integrate into the outside community. All these things are definitely like being discussed openly, and it's very difficult for them but we get to learn a lot in the meantime. So now getting back to how race and language and community intersect. So uh, True Biz does a good job of explaining sort of the history of black American Sign Language, which is very different from American Sign Language, similar to how um, African American vernacular English is very different to um, what we call standard English and how they're, they're different languages and different dialects and that they need to be equally respected. But Novich goes more into the history of why that is, which is super fascinating. And because of um, eugenic policies, um, ASL was actually banned in schools from 1880 until 1980. So for a full hundred years, schools were not using or teaching 
sign language and because of racism they no one ever cared about the black schools <laughs> so no one ever checked so black deaf schools continued you know using and teaching sign language and so their sign language is actually very similar to what it was in 1880 whereas the sign language that emerged in 1980 after this 100 year gap of not being allowed to use it ended up being very different from the original sign language so i thought that was super fascinating and so getting back to We Love You, Charlie Freeman, I mentioned that the family's not deaf. So you might be saying to yourself, well, then why do they all sign? Like, do they have a deaf family member or something? No, actually, it's all the mom. She is a sign language enthusiast. She works as an interpreter. And it's because when she was young, she grew up in Maine, which is very white. And she basically felt so excluded from her classmates in her hearing school that she was drawn to the black sign language school where she learned sign language so that she could communicate with the black deaf students because she felt a closer pull to community with them than with the white hearing students. So this is very interesting to explore because, you know, we think of language as sort of the base of a community, but in this instance, she felt her community with other black people, even if they didn't speak the same language, to the point where she taught herself that language just so she could communicate with them. And so I, so I think we normally think of language as this sort of like foundation of community. And if we all speak the same language, we can be part of a community. But this is a really interesting example of how that's not necessarily the case and that, you know, community isn't always derived from language itself. So now let's get into power dynamics. There's a lot of different power dynamics happening in these two books. Very interesting. So the first one I want to talk about is the mother-father dynamic. In both these books, the mothers are sort of the driving force for sort of the setup for these books. So in We Love You, Charlie Freeman, the mom is the one that learned the sign language. And then in True Biz, Charlie's mom, she is the one that has decided she's going to get cochlear implants. She's not allowed to sign. She's not allowed to know deaf children. So eventually both of the fathers push back but these these mothers um, being in charge of the decision making it's really not them being like evil villains and like doing terrible things it's that they succumb to systemic pressure that they you know are not super women they can't just pretend all these things aren't there so for example Laurel she you know pulls the family out of their living situation she you know she decides oh we're gonna move to this rural area that's um, quite racist and and we're going to be very isolated in this institute because she has kind of fallen under the lure of like oh it's for science we're improving the world and she really just is excited to do good for the world and cannot see clearly the 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 negative aspects of being at this institute whereas with charlie's mom from true biz she you know of course has a lot of ableism happening she has a lot of gener intergenerational trauma and things like that but Ultimately, she is just listening to what doctors are telling her. So the medical doctors are saying, do the cochlear implant. The medical doctors are saying, don't let her learn sign language. And of course, you know, she's not questioning this um, because it's what she wants to hear. But also she's not questioning it because it's very normal to not question doctors. Most people don't question doctors and most people don't critically think about what doctors tell them. So it's totally understandable that both of these women are making maybe not the best choices for their family because of these, um, you know, cultural and systemic values of trusting science, trusting doctors into doing the right thing. And meanwhile, they're not critically thinking, is this the best for my family? And the third um, sort of theme around power in both of these books is science and how we kind of put too much faith in science sometimes. Um, as, a, as a scientist, it's very hard to talk about this in a, in a way that, that doesn't, you know, inflame one side or the other because, of course, you know, science is critiquable. There's lots of harm perpetuated by science and science is not always done well, of course. Um, but I don't want that to stoke any like, you know, all science is bullshit. We don't need to listen to it kind of vibe either. So it's sort of like a balance. Like you need to be able to critique it. You need to be able to say actually no um, to certain things, but not throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. And frankly, most of the problems with science is over interpretation. So just if we could just teach people to interpret science better, that would probably solve like 50% of the problems. But back to the books, the the two, you know, books really do a good job of exploring how the pressure um, or validation of, of science um, 
really kind of affects these characters and how they're able to like properly experience their lives and make, make decisions even. So for example, when they sign up for the experiment, um, I'm not sure how much was actually explained to the mom beforehand, but you know, a lot of really creepy things get overlooked because like, oh, it's, an, it's a science experiment. We need to like let these things happen because of a science experiment. And I don't want to give too many details because it's like, you know, that's half the fun of reading the book. But for example, one of them is that like this man just follows them around all the time videotaping them. And I mean, that's pretty standard, like, you know, they want to see the the chimp, like, you know, how well he's signing and, and kind of like the, the progression and things like that. But, but also no, like, this is an actual family with children who go to school and like, are living and to just have this man with a videotape walking around filming them all the time. You know, an ethics board would definitely have said, actually, no, maybe just do one hour a day of like family time where there's a video happening but not this like you know, he's like a reality tv show cameraman like he is following them all the time and um you know he's not a bad person and and they're friends with him actually but this this like you know as a, it's one of those things that i mentioned earlier with the creepy arc of like what is happening here it's like why is this allowed to happen like who made this decision and you're like mm. um and it's all like kind of just glossed over because like oh but that's part of the science experiment you know and then in True Biz, of course, Charlie's entire existence is determined by what medical doctors have said, and uh, they're mostly wrong. <laughs> uh, so medical doctors, you know, feel like they should own the narrative about, you know, being deaf and how to, you know, make a deaf life better, things like that. And, you know, 90% of children are born to hearing parents, so they're not born into a culture that might already know some of the answers, and there's no effort on a medical establishment's part to sort of connect hearing parents with deaf parents of deaf children. They don't want this influence of the deaf community telling hearing parents that, you know, cochlear implants are a tool of genocide. And they want to feel like they know what's best for deaf children. But the truth is cochlear implants have been approved for children in the US since 1997. So we have no idea, like the long term impacts of cochlear implants, we have no idea if deaf adults who grew up as children with implants think it's a good idea. Like that's, that's, it hasn't been really fully explored yet. And so this narrative of like, oh, it's best, it's best, it's best, over, overshadows basically Charlie's entire life and kind of predetermines it before she was even born. And without, so without getting into spoilers, there's a big pharma component of this um, um, as well. So um, it's just overall very interesting look at how the power of like science and medicine and technology can sort of like subsume characters' lives and really like influence their paths um, without them necessarily even being fully aware of it. Alrighty, so that's it for these two books. As you might guess, I highly recommend both of them. I enjoyed them very much. Um, I think it's pretty rare for coming of age stories to feel so adult or like written more for adults. We Love You Charlie Freeman is probably the better one in terms of like literary value. Things like the character development and the synthesis of very sto various story arcs happening in the book are are just done better like objectively I think and that's and that's a little bit less the case with True Biz because it is such um it's so strongly focused on being a social novel it really wants to get those issues up front and so it's, t it's taking on a ton of different intersections. Like, I didn't even mention half of them in this video and so there's a lot to sort of cover in a very short amount of time in a novel and it's it ends up being very abrupt you know oh, all of a sudden we're talking about this and like oh all of a sudden there's this other character to illustrate this and we don't see those characters fleshed out as much so while true biz is a really good book i recommend it really you shouldn't pick it up unless you're actually really wanting to learn about deaf culture and like activism and social justice and things like that because it's not i mean it's a, it's a good story it's a fun story but it's definitely so steeped in those things that if you're not interested in those things, I can't imagine you being interested in the larger story. I learned so much in this book because it's very, very informative. Um, it even has like little nonfiction sections about deaf history. So even just from those alone, you'll learn so much. Both are available on audiobook and I recommend the audiobooks for both. But in particular, I, per I recommend doing both the audio and um, a hard copy or ebook of True Biz because the author felt, the author's deaf and she felt very strongly <laughs> about an audiobook because of course audiobooks are not accessible to deaf people. So her compromise was that while the narrator was speaking the words as a deaf person was signing, they layered in the sound of her signing and then layered over the words so you knew exactly when someone was signing or not. And in the book, it is um, sometimes they, they show little figures signing 
Um, and then other times they just, it's just very interestingly laid out and it's very um, unique and novel formatting. So I highly recommend both side by side so you can experience it fully. So as you might have guessed, uh, neither of these books have a black deaf protagonist or a black deaf author. And I'm pretty sure it's because that book does not exist yet. If I'm wrong and it does, please let me know in the comments down below. I'm super curious to read it if it exists. But in the meantime, have you read either of these books or have you come up with any book pairings in your reading life that, you know, kind of surprised you? Um, or maybe they're on purpose, I don't know. And if it does happen to you, are they coincidental? Do you feel like it's a coincidence when a book pairing just like naturally emerges? Or do you think it's more about like, oh, I'm thinking about one thing and that leads me to be drawn to another book about the similar thing? Because I'm always trying to decide like, is it a coincidence when it happens to me? Or is it something that, you know, is, is more me putting out this sort of like energy or desire to read about something um, in particular. I'm always curious about things like that. So looking forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments down below. And until next time, bye.